For now, we move on to Payday 2, the game and the story that many of us started with and where it gets a little more complicated. In this episode, it's a case of back to basics, but we're going to be introduced to a number of pivotal reoccurring figures with shady motivations and a brand new crew member. So sit back, relax and enjoy. This is the story of Payday. If you think back to last episode, we left off with the crew relocating to build a new criminal legacy in Washington DC, where Bane had been working on a deeper surveillance network in the two years of the crew's hiatus in hiding. Crime.net was bigger and better than ever and ready for his most prolific criminal associates, the Payday Gang, to make full use of. However, Bane, having become more wrapped up in the teachings of Cagliostro after obtaining his manuscript from the No Mercy job, is fixated on the idea that a criminal crew should operate as four, and having lost one of their key members, the now incarcerated Hoxton, they would need to recruit. This wouldn't take long, as criminal tendencies tend to be environmental, and so it should be no surprise that Dallas would induct his equally criminally inclined younger brother into the gang. Dallas's brother would take on the mantle of Hoxton, partially out of respect for their incarcerated friend and partially to maintain their aura of invincibility and reputation built up over the events of Payday the Heist. This new Hoxton was quite a different beast to his old namesake. Lacking the liberal use of profanity and sarcastic sense of humour, New Hox was much more serious, stoic and meticulous in his mannerisms. His backstory isn't particularly clear and real name is unknown, and although he shares some similarities to his brother, he's 13 years his junior, so Dallas was likely already an accessory of the Chicago mob before he'd even started school. This left New Hoxton as a man who struggled to fit into society, failed to hang on to a job, and quickly turned, like his brother, to crime. Starting out as a minor conman and burglar, he inherited some of Dallas's enemies as well as making his own, committing his first major felony at the age of 24 to earn the money needed to keep their hostility at bay. By the time he joins the Payday Gang, he's been deep in the world of crime for seven years, making him 31 when Dallas reaches out with an invitation to his infamous crew. It's fairly noticeable that New Hawks lacks many social graces, as well as hating crowded spaces, maybe explaining why he prefers to go unnoticed as the resident stealth expert. Coupled with his obsessive tendencies, straight edge approach to heisting, and the occasional uncomfortably delivered pager line, some have speculated he may suffer from mild autism. Where I admit that old and new Hopston's interests do intersect is their respective specialisations, both being keen infiltrators and marksmen, a role that Bane would summarise as the ghost. Upon returning to the field, there was somewhat of a shake-up in the squad's roles. Worf remaining the technician, but Dallas gaining the role of mastermind, owing to his leadership and reasonable medical experience, while Chain starts living his best life as the team's enforcer, far removed from his old support status. Our new Hoxton's ghost role highlighted the move the gang was making away from every heist being a display of physical force and brutality, adding some much needed guile and subtlety to operations, as Bane increasingly saw the value of getting in and out quietly. So we begin the Payday 2 timeline and here is where we run into our first problem. Later in Payday 2's development cycle, a story mode was added. This mode quite frankly cannibalizes itself. There are so many inconsistencies between it, Payday the Heist and the well-established FBI file timeline that I'm going to ignore its chronology completely in this video series, although I will use it to add a little bit more context to certain heists where it makes sense. The first events of Payday 2 consist of Bane testing the aptitude of the new member to the crew, as well as seeing just how rusty they've become in two years without any challenge. Over those two years, the police continued to pursue the newly named clown case against the Payday gang but had assumed that the capture of the original Hoxton had broken up their spree and reduced the likelihood of them returning. This meant that even if the gang had become peripheral figures to the DC law enforcement, there was still evidence on record of their crimes. As such, Bane sends the four to the docks to retrieve a server access code and delete their case files from the Washington police database, giving the crew a blank slate of sorts to enact their Washington crime spree upon. In the police building, we see a number of indications that Bane's usual targets, the banks and art galleries of Washington, are under close surveillance. We also see an arrest warrant for New Hoxton, suggesting something of his entry into the gang was picked up or leaked, maybe by some sort of informant. 
Using their newfound anonymity, the gang decide to announce their presence once again, hitting a low-life mobster's nightclub for a meager amount of stolen cocaine, again testing the crew's abilities in a gunfight. But so much for a blank slate, eh? After this, Bane reveals the location of their initial safe house, a laundromat called Bodie's Dry Cleaning, the codename Bane uses for the crew's above-the-law ventures, as we saw back in Counterfeit. Though simple, this location holds much of the gang's old equipment stored and saved from their past ventures in Payday the Heist, ready to be utilised in this second spree, as well as a little information Bane's been holding regarding the secret and the hunt for Baldwin. The first wave of crime the gang embark upon can be broken down into two categories, jewellery hits and bank hits. It's unclear how many jobs of this sort the gang did, but the FBI files note that calls from jewellery retailers around DC came in often to report armed robberies at their stores. A more noteworthy jewellery take was the GOLED Familia Diamond Store, its busy downtown location being seen as a crime deterrent, but the Milano jewellers obviously hadn't encountered Bane, who saw the opposite. Sending in the crew despite moderate security to show no location is safe from the payday gang. On the bank front, Washington law enforcement should have known this was the clown's bread and butter, but that didn't save multiple harvest and trusty bank locations being cleaned out for gold, cash, and the contents of deposit boxes. This particularly irked the federal government as H&T's losses were all insured federally. Other branches, such as the Roberts Bank in suburban Washington, and seemingly first world branded locations were just as exposed. Go Bank virtually signaling that the size of the take was unimportant to Bain, seeing the value in ensuring all of Washington's financial institutions that they were at the mercy of the payday gang. These bank jobs also showcase the power of the Thermal Lance, a brand new drill designed specifically to get through the thick vault doors. Their steadily rising riches had to be spent somewhere, so Bain suggested the crew upgrade their arsenal via one of his DC contacts. Codenamed Gage, surname known to be Gagowski, is an Afghanistan war veteran turned black market weapons dealer. Paralyzed from the waist down in a failed assassination attempt from an unhappy client, Gage is not one to be underestimated despite his frail appearance. Bane describes him as being two steps ahead of most in the criminal underworld, and we know for a fact he is both heartless and financially obsessed, as the FBI files report his discharge from the army came from being hit by friendly fire after attempting to loot the body of his comrade. A real bastard, but not one that we can't deal with. Speaking the language of money, the gang are able to deal with him and acquire some new and useful tools of war. Soon after, the armored transport hits would take place, a series of jobs which Bane contracts based off information on armored vehicle movements received from a Gensec informant. In one of the four separate takes orchestrated in highly public locations around the city, the gang find blueprints containing information regarding the movement of a classified military weapon being moved in secure civilian rail transport. Ever opportunistic, Bane again sends the squad to track down the train and liberate the tech for the gang's coffers, found to be a state-of-the-art automatic turret. The gang, of course, happily oblige. Following these early heists, essentially warm-up jobs for the out-of-practice crew, Bane started to up the ante, testing the crew's versatility and adaptation to the new stealth prerogative. Shadow Raid was the perfect mission for this, giving the crew no choice but to avoid detection and New Hoxton a chance to impress. This job is actually contracted through Gage unofficially, who got wind of the Murky Water Mercenary Company, remember them as that shady Merc group from the last video, storing and moving spores of war from worldwide conflicts. As Gage intended to assist in future payday operations, and given he lacked the legal connections required to get away with doing a job allowed, the crew were forced to complete the heist without raising the alarm. This is possible, as they knew the shady nature of Murky Water's operations made it hard for them to bring the police into any sort of burglary matters. The crew entered the warehouse silently on the bank of the Potomac River, liberating much of their illegal contraband, including a full suit of authentic samurai armor belonging once to the famed Oda Nobunaga, much to the joy of Gage. Following this success, Gage hooks the gang up with more advanced and powerful weaponry, at a price of course. Particularly after the Payday Gang's success with the Murkies, impressing with their in and out silent handling of the job, Bane starts to think outside of himself, contacting a few influential individuals in the DC area, including an old friend of sorts. They would provide the gang with their own heists as independent contractors. During one hit on a larger Washington bank under the much maligned First World ownership, one of Bane's associates would introduce himself to the gang in quite some fashion. Before the SWAT team arrives and you can accept my invitation to my SUV. We, we drink, we talk, huh? Have some vodka, excellent vodka. 
Vlad, 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 where to start on Vladislav Kozak, the enigmatic Ukrainian who once worked as an enforcer within the Russian mob. He's no one-dimensional criminal, having tried his hand at just about every crooked escapade under the sun, settling on extortion and racketeering in the DC area. A bit of a wild card who certainly offers uniquely violent and public contracts. What we learn about Vlad over time is that he may be a little crazy, but he certainly is no fool, appearing to have contacts on the inside of the DC police force and links to many influential associations back in his European homeland. Even now as we embark on the Silk Road campaign, we're finding that Vlad may have been more influential than we could have known. As of this point in the story, his recent eight year stint in prison drove his proactive desire for revenge via the Payday Gang. Not only did Vlad offer his own jobs, he would also directly get the crew back in touch with one pivotal figure, but more on him later. After his introduction, Vlad sends the gang on a tirade of personal favors designed to re-cement his position in Washington's underworld. Mall Crasher appears to be the first of Vlad's jobs the crew embarks on, consisting of high vandalism if such a charge existed, something not within the gang's usual line of work. I think this displays just how unconventional a contractor Vlad is and how influential he must be, despite his odd exterior, if Bane insisted on his top crew risking their freedom in such a public display of destruction. Vlad's briefing demanded they create $50,000 worth of destruction in the Shield Mall by any means necessary to force its owner, a Mr. Stone, to pay up for Vlad's valuable protection in his racketeering ring. As with many of Vlad's jobs, planning was a secondary factor, going in blind other than knowing a chopper-assisted escape was their route out, piloted this time by Bile, Bane's secondary helicopter pilot. Soon after returning, Vlad again wanted us to do his seemingly simple dirty work in what became known as the Four Stores Heist. This time, the crew were amused by the simplicity of a hit on four basic stores in a quiet part of town for just $15,000 worth of miscellaneous loot nothing compared to what they were doing back west. What Vlad failed to mention was the armed security and connections these shops had to the Russian Mafia, of which he was once a part. Well, seeing as these shops used to operate business for Vlad himself, it's not much of a surprise that he wanted to get some revenge for their lack of loyalty to him when he was incarcerated. In any event, the crew managed well enough, despite Vlad's unwillingness to work with details taking a token sum that was more of a sign of things to come than it was a great take for our crew. Now we move to two jobs even more personal for Vlad, both part of a crusade against his former friend turned snitch Dmitry Volkov, a Russian mafia boss living out the DC area. Ukrainian job looked like a standard jewelry store smash and grab, but standard jewels were not really on Vlad's radar. He was more interested in stealing a one-of-a-kind tiara lined up for Dmitry's bride-to-be to wear at their wedding. As Vlad says, this is more about ruining the perfect day of his once friend than it was a financial venture. The crew head to the back of the store to liberate the tiara, enraging Dimitri's future wife so much that she even goes as far as to call off the wedding. A big win for Vlad, but not enough. Next up on his hit list was the Tasteful Club, a nightclub owned by Dimitri and one of his greatest assets, hosting illegal gambling and being a safe house so to speak for his take and product in many illicit dealings. Vlad wanted us to clean him out, take whatever was in his safe and massacre the profitability of his club in the process, giving us free reign to do whatever we wanted with him should we happen upon the man himself. Things went as planned and Vlad's influence was reasserted at the expense of his rival competitors. Unsurprisingly, Vlad's impressed and so points us in Hector's direction, the Colombian drug lord to whom we fenced that Mayan gold after overdrill a higher up in the Mexican Sinaloan cartel and once founder of the diminished Morales cartel, Hector was beyond pivotal to the East Coast drug trafficking operations of the period. We know Hector had some indirect contact with the gang two years ago and we know he was cemented within Bane's crime.net infrastructure, so clearly a man we should trust. Vlad presented an opportunity for direct contact with the man himself, offering jobs which revolved around cartel operations and revenge, primarily using the gang as drug escorts and paying exceptionally well for their services. Yet every job always seemed to go a little astray. In Watch Dogs, Hector sends the gang as convoy guards, holding the back of a meat truck full of his product like fish in a barrel. An issue that came to the fore as a police ambush is sprung on the crew surrounding the truck. At this point, the department really has little respect for the firepower and ingenuity of the clowns though, shooting their way out of the situation with the drug bags in tow. 
following this, Hector orders the gang to a dockside location in an armoured pickup vehicle, aiming to move the remaining cocaine by boat, a task which they unsurprisingly are up to, despite the location also already being staked out by the Washington PD. Seeing the gang's value in a pinch and seeking to leverage them even further, Operation Firestarter commenced, aimed at the rival Mendoza cartel. Hector sends the four to a private airstrip to steal or destroy a shipment of AKMs. He then sends them straight into the heavily guarded lion's den, the FBI branch office, seeking a server containing Mendoza banking records. Strange that a cartel appeared to be entering into police surveillance and protection. Finally, using the financial records to find their bank's location, the gang go and set fire to the cartel's well, not before noticing a high voltage trap set at the vault door, a mechanism set specifically against their thermal lance, and the peculiarity of Hector's request to record burning the funds. Despite these oddities, and Hector's unemotional response to the gang completing his request, the money was so good that the gang were comfortable in undertaking the heist rats. Hector reports that the Mendoza's top lieutenants are fleeing the country and wants to intercept them to enact his full and brutal revenge. The four were to escort methamphetamine cucks to assist in a deal with another DC gang, the Cobras, trading product for information regarding the Mendoza's escape plan. When the crew arrived at the location deep in the woods, they found the Mendoza's men attacking the lab and executing the cucks, leaving them with little choice but to cut for themselves, while under fire from the police who arrived rapidly given the secluded forest location of the laboratory. Escaping this close call with enough product to appease the Cobras, a deal is brokered and the escape convoy of the Mendoza's revealed. The gang quickly descends to intercept the escape route on a bridge out of the city as time was obviously of the essence. To their surprise, the Mendoza's civilian bus was being flanked by police escorts. An even greater surprise comes after gunning down the poorly protected transport vehicle, they find it rigged with C4, another last gasp effort to take out the payday gang. Irrespective of the close calls and peculiarity of the police cooperation with a renowned violent cartel, Hector simply understatedly thanks the gang before going dark on Crime.net. Finally, we have John Henry Simmons, nicknamed publicly The Elephant, a corrupt Republican congressman whose intentions seem far from straightforward. Again an associate of Baines, his jobs are some of the dirtiest the gang participate in early on, with a political spin that often involves some sort of blackmail or deception. It's notable that the elephant's jobs tend towards rewarding stealth and subterfuge to not draw any heat on himself, a political crook of the highest order and one that you wouldn't expect Bain to be keen to work with, but I suppose any high political connection is a good one in this world. First up we have Big Oil. On the face of it, from a humanitarian point of view, Big Oil is probably the worst job we've partaken in thus far. The Elephant wanted us to steal a cold fusion reactor from the secluded laboratory of Nobel Prize winner Professor Rossi. Apparently, this genius scientist had made an incredible breakthrough in the field, offering a source of power that may have left the oil industry dead in the water, something Simmons could not allow. This would involve us gathering intel on the reactor's location from a biker gang who were also interested in acquiring the fusion reactor, and heading over to the newly acquired laboratory address. Rossi and his engine were situated down in the basement of the mansion which housed the lab. From here they would work out which reactor had achieved successful fusion and then airlift the technology back into the right hands, thanks again to Pilot Bile. Not a move for the betterment of the human race. From Bane's point of view though, a lot of the corrupt powers that be were heavily invested in this new technology, so to him, it's a fair price to pay if it means structural reform in the long term. Delighted we could maintain his Republican goldmine, the congressman decides to have us wipe out the competition before his bid for senatorship. Framing frame is of course a framing job, but one carried out on a politician with his own dirt apparently. The gang would head to the Capitol Art Gallery to acquire several valuable paintings from a new Singaporean art exhibit fencing these paintings to the incumbent senator's people with hidden surveillance cameras installed. The final day saw the crew again leveraging Hoxton's expertise, using the cameras to assist his movements around the senator's rooftop apartment and plant cocaine in his mansion. Whilst foolproofing the framing job and accessing the man's electronic devices, Bain discovers the popular senator was not at all clean himself, being involved in his own weapon and drug trafficking operations while in office, so I suppose here the ends really do justify the means. As pointed out by the FBI files, this would have just the effect of political musical chairs the elephant needed to find himself in that newly vacant senator role. 
Crime.net's insider asset was becoming more influential, an influence that Simmons himself suggests should be spread more directly to DC's leadership, putting forward just the man for mayoral candidate. Getting his man Robert McKendrick into power as DC mayor involved a smattering of vote fixing in the heist election day, tracking the electronic voting machines to a dockside warehouse and further tagging them to a Goose Island storage facility. Here the crew would use, again, infiltration and subterfuge to access the machines and input fraudulent votes for McKendrick's opponent, Mayor Nancy Schwartz, disqualifying her as a candidate and giving McKendrick the appointment by default. A seemingly useful ally, considering his entire campaign was driven on anti-payday gang sentiment, as within the month, McKendrick has old Hoxton moved to a lower security prison, in anticipation for a potential retrial something the gang wouldn't have to wait long to act upon, as McKendrick wasn't the only pivotal character to the breakout we'd be hearing from. Soon after, the dentist would come calling. How did it feel, leaving him behind? Olga, would you show Mr. Steele the Department of Corrections transfer plan for inmate Jim Hawksworth? Thank you.